if you can kind of recenter on like what you know to be true and who and what you really are, it kind of starts to feel like all of the little things that could sneak into your head and make you doubt a decision that you're making or a way you want to communicate something kind of just fall away. Here we are, folks. Welcome to No Surprises, a look inside the ambitious, joyful, and occasionally terrifying journey of creators. Um, Kels, we have a super special guest today. And I mean, super special because they happen to be one of our best friends. Well, and I feel like this is so unique because when we get together, we don't do as much work stuff. Mal is so good about this. Like, Mallory has a rich world outside of work and I'm in a place in my life. You're a mother world... that equates to a rich world outside well, of work. It, for it the is. Record. I have a rich <laughs> world outside of work, but it's like my kid opened the refrigerator and picked up a jar of pickles and then like itched away going two tickles, two tickles. Like that's funny to me, but that's not really a conversation topic, right? <laughs> like what, what, what is there to give? You just, oh everyone else God. goes, oh yeah, I'm sure that was really cute. And it's like, I, you didn't make him. So you don't feel the or the surge of <laughs> adrenaline tickles. that I get watching him be like two tickles. And then me being like, no, it's 6 AM. Give me the pickles. You're going to mess up your stomach. No, like there's I no love that your son there. loves pickles as much as you do. He okay. also is anyway. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, Daniel. like I said, um, we don't do a lot of work talk because I think we're so focused on putting that aside to be people with each other. Yeah. That Rach, I always have a million questions about your job and your work because it is so different from, we overlap a lot, but you work in a completely different environment than we do. So mm -hmm. we're really excited to have this conversation because we don't get to do this a lot. So wait, let's talk about this really quick. A proper introduction for Rachel. I was going to, I was just going to say, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, no, no I was get. Get in there. <laughs> I was like, I know how long this can go with the three I of know. us. You go. Um, you go. Okay. So it's not that she's just her best friend. Rachel, she hails from Chicago. Um, we've known her for quite some time uh, yes. back when she was a publicist. And now she holds the role of Senior Director of Corporate Affairs and Communications for Molson Coors, which for a lot of words coming out of my mouth basically means she's in charge of comms for Molson Coors, like the biggest beer brand yeah. there is. Um, yeah. No small feat, we and we are infinitely impressed by you um, exactly. every day, all day. As someone who got to listen to your work calls for a year when we lived together, I was like, she's really smart. <laughs> yes. And Rachel actually started out as our one of our clients, mm -hmm. as, a, as someone working with one of our clients. And then we met and immediately were like, oh no, we, we all vibe extremely hard and, and now, um, spend recreational no, your, time together. Your words, your exact words were, hi, I, Mallory, I like to bring Rachel into the friend fold. <laughs> <laughs> you actually said that to me in some version I remember. of that. We were like out to lunch and we were like, she was like, I will, I would like her to be a close friend of ours. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I anyway, think it was because we, we met and you were doing, like, you just had this, I, I remember having a similar feeling when I met Mallory was just like, I'm in awe of this person and also their personality rocks. So yeah. Rach, we have now, um, uh, really, uh, piled up. the sugar at your feet, Yeah, but I want you to tell us a little bit about the arc of your career. Where did you start? And now tell us and where, tell us a little bit where you started, how you got where you are now, and then kind of like an overview of the type of work you do in the day to day. First of all, do you gas all of your guests? Yes, it's much because I'm feeling amazing right now. I told we, you, I told you, this do, three right? hours of sleep was going to float away. You're going to leave being <laughs> feeling more energized than ever have you ever have. <laughs> My gosh, it's like four cups of coffee. I feel amazing. Yeah, yeah baby. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. First of all, I'm not even going to thank you for having me on this podcast first, because thank you for violating the coveted no new friends as an adult rule for me. Uh, I think it was 
<laughs> I'm looking at the bottom right hand of my screen right now and trying to do simple math, which on three hours of sleep is like no. way no. above no. my pay grade. Throw out right numbers. Now. Just throw it out. I know. It's been almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think Impossible. we became instant best friends. Impossible. Uh, yeah. And I'm so lucky to know you both and to have both of you in my life. And the feeling was totally mutual when we first met. Um, wowed by your personalities, wowed by your beauty uh, inside and out, and was instantly fascinated by what you all did because for as central as, you know, being creative and writing, making things, you know, just thinking about wild stuff has been to every part of my life and career. I never went the entrepreneurial route. I always kind of found safety. And I'm so sorry if you hear any like weird sounds from my computer, try to turn them all off, but there might be a little care. thing or two. Um, I always found safety and uh, kind of comfort in working for a company that somebody else had started and figuring out how to make it better um, and how to, you know, help people see it in a different light or usher a brand or a company into its next stage. And I think that's because um, I grew up as the daughter of a writer and an English professor. And there are a lot of people in my family who are words people, science and numbers people too, but I fall a little bit more on the word side, I would say. Um, and I grew up under trial by fire from my mom for perfecting every paper that I submitted, every assignment that I wrote, um, nothing was sacred or safe. And I kind of had to become egoless pretty quickly mm. about my own work. But I also really got um, an at-home A-plus education in editing. And mm. I think that kind of made me uh, an editor at heart versus what you might consider to be kind of a stereotypical creator. So yeah. I've always kind of been in a position where I feel more empowered, I feel more comfortable, and I kind of feel like my smartest, most valuable self when I get to edit something, you know, that already exists. And I think you can use that general idea and apply it to all sorts of things, not just words on a page, but concepts you know reputation. editing is one of the most important part of our concept I mean Kel we both know that's like I mean I'm guilty of doing so many things and then being like steal back delete that element delete this element like editing is out. so important yeah. you get it all out and then you subtract so that you're like oh this doesn't fit this doesn't fit a hundred percent. I think the idea of editing, that's probably why people got so into like the KonMari method and the home edit and house flipping probably to an extent. I do think people get a lot of satisfaction from watching editing happen, from editing themselves. I go into my closet probably once every two weeks and edit it, um, which mostly just means like picking up, you know, crumpled clothing off the floor and figuring out what's dirty and goes in the hamper and what's like okay for one more wear and yes. putting that back on a hanger <laughs> I have that I have that as well a whole chair of clothes that aren't quite dirty enough to go in the hamper yet <laughs> oh god stuff chair I love the stuff everyone has it well you know Rachel I think that's such an interesting perspective on your like the the seed at the center of your creative work because I would have never predicted you starting off telling us about that but as you talk about it I think it's so accurate and also such an under appreciated piece of like being someone who works in a creative field mm -hmm. because I feel like you do you have people who are able to generate a lot of ideas and it takes a skilled hand to sift through and figure out what's good and what can be stripped away to make the point more powerful. How has that played out for you in your position? Like, what's that look like in your day to day? Man, it kind of comes through everything. So yeah. I, the details of my actual job are pretty 
you know, pretty boring. <laughs> if I were to, you know, take you through what a day looks like. I love it. I love what I do. And I love the people that I get to work with um, and the types of situations that, you know, I'm in every day. But it's like when, you know, when I talk to a family member after work and they're like, what did you do at work today? What projects did you work on? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> The actual well, I, hour by hour of it is pretty, um, pretty unexciting if you're not fully in it, kind of at the center, um, which is, I think, kind of where you get all of the texture that influences why you're making the decisions that you're making and why you're recommending that things happen a certain way. Yeah. Um, but I think that how how the idea of kind of editing and paring back and refining things manifests in my kind of everyday work is that I'm constantly both zoomed out at this is kind of jargony but like a 10,000 foot level I guess you could say yeah. while at the same time being mindful of all of the finite details that you know make our brands what they are that make our company what it is and I have to balance those two things at the exact same time, but also really stick to what's true yeah. um, and who we are as a business. I think this is true for any company or any brand that you might be working on. Um, and you kind of have to block out the noise that way to say, what do I stand for at the end of the day? What is the history that I've been founded on? Uh, what do people expect of me? And how do I, you know, want to be known a month from now, six months from now, five years from now? So you can kind of take all the inputs from the little details of what's actually happening, you know, on any given Wednesday, but recenter yourself in ultimately what you're trying to do, who you are, and how you want to be known, right? Yeah. Both Mm -hmm. in the immediate and a long time from now, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that makes the process of filtering out, you know, what's right, what's wrong, what's the right, you know, line of messaging or tagline for something or way to deliver a speech. I do a lot of speech writing these days. Um, if you can kind of recenter on like what you know to be true and who and what you really are, it kind of starts to feel like all of the little things that could sneak into your head and make you doubt a decision that you're making or a way you want to communicate something kind of just fall away. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you have this sort of ultimate gut check that can kind of be like your editing barometer for anything. When yeah. you use the word filter, it's the same way. You What you're describing is the same way I use the word lanes. With, but I like yours better, right? Because we talk about this a lot at Week of the Website. This is the whole reason we went through a positioning workshop. We have our values. We know what we stand for. We know who we are. We know what we want to be. And then we have Kelsey and myself at the top, like as you're doing, because your title is director, like you're directing. We have the most like high level 10,000 foot view of everything that's going on. There are so many moving parts, so many different pieces of, um, you know, people are coming up with different ideas, they're throwing things in, and we're looking at it, like, for example, I'm looking at it from the marketing point of view, I'm like, okay, we have this different content, we have these channels, we have our values up at top, we have our messaging architecture right beneath that. Now, what makes sense in this? Well, not everyone on all of these individual teams talk to each other. So it really comes down to us to be like, all right, these are the lanes we're staying in. This is where I'm going to give you guidance. Stick close to this. Don't think like you have to come up with an idea out of thin air grounded in these things so that you know how to sort of uh, stick to a cohesive messaging choice. The whole yeah. point of it is being like, got to stay cohesive across everything that we do, but we also want those things to have individual personalities and how do you mold those two things? But I like yeah. your use of the word filter instead, because mm -hmm. really what you're doing is you're like, there's this multitude of ideas or opportunities and you're just trying to figure out, okay, which ones actually fit into this grander scheme of what we're trying to be yeah. and which one don't, which ones don't. So Rachel, this is the first time that you have really built a team in this 
capacity, right? I mean, I know in the past, like some of your other roles, you have had, you know, additional team members join, but I know the formation and development of your team has been a really big part of your work at Molson Coors. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's like, what it, what it's like helping everybody understand the things that they are, you know, the lanes that they're staying in or the the filters that they're looking through? Yeah, absolutely. And I think everyone has kind of a different approach to this, right? So like most teams, I have been lucky to hire some new folks and bring them into the fold. Uh, But I also have a bunch of team members who have really strong, enduring institutional knowledge of what we do, who have been in their roles for longer than I've been in mine. So kind of have a mixture of people who are seeing things with fresh eyes and then people who are seeing things through the lens of, oh, well, we did things, you know, a certain way last year or the year before, in some cases like 10 years ago, and here's how we've evolved since then. And Mm -hmm. here's why I think we should go, you know, to this place over here next based on what I know up until this point. So Mm -hmm. I think that diversity of thought is essential. I was listening to the last podcast that you all did, the first uh, episode of season two. Mm -hmm. And um, you guys are talking about something that I've been thinking about so much recently, which is that you don't want to be the smartest person in the room and that you want to know enough to be dangerous. This is like, it's wild that that came up on that podcast because it's been maybe the number one topic that I've been thinking about for like the last three, four weeks. Um, Uh Yeah. Because yeah. I think I, I naturally come into situations and I think I took that phrase knowledge is power a little too much to heart when I probably heard it on like a schoolhouse rock or a Sesame Street when I was little. <laughs> um, so I am, I'm a recovering know-it-all. And <laughs> same, I'm, Rach, same. Yeah, it's I really embrace funny. now asking the question, I don't know what that is. Can you tell me yeah. more about that versus being you, like, I know. Do you know of like a program or somewhere that we can go to like fix this part of our brains? Because it's really, really hard to undo when you, uh, when you kind of have that messed up thought pattern of, well, if I just know more, then I'll be able to figure it out. Or, well, if I, if I know enough, then everyone will respect me. Right. Not to get into our backgrounds about anything, but like, you know, we have been trained to think about things in a way where we're pretty self-sufficient. Um, and that's a great thing. That is a superpower, but it comes at odds with this idea of leadership, right? Cause with leadership, you go from when you're working in the job, right? You're doing the work, but when you are in a leadership position, as we all are, your job is to build the team to do the work. So it's not our job to be experts. We need to be really good at hiring, um, and really good at finding talent and people that vibe, But it's not our job. Like we talk about knowing enough to be dangerous. A really great example of that going on right now in our company is me as the acting like financial officer handing that off to an advisor because I'm like, you know what? I know. I I said to Kelsey yesterday, go, I know enough to be dangerous, like pretty damn dangerous in the world of finance. But at this point, we have got so many different things going on that. I think we need an expert. And that's what it is. Like you bring in the people who are smarter than you in their individual ways and they add their, add their flair to it. And it's just our job to sit there and be like, you're so smart. (laughs) Thank you for giving us your brilliant ideas. It's such an interesting evolution of the ego, right? Mm. Because I feel like, uh, I feel very like I'm in this picture and I don't like it as we talk about the, you know, the know-it-all syndrome of just like, (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's, that's my little really... cappy, my little Capricorn. Oh, yeah. oh, no, <laughs> so bad. <laughs> God bless there's, the two of us. There's definitely a right thing to do things. Right? <laughs> there's a right way. And then there's the thing that everyone else is doing. Um, no. And I think it's like, it, it's weird because the more you try to step away from that and cultivate like a continued approach of like looking for answers outside of yourself, the more you realize that that's a protective instinct to be like, like you said, Rachel, if I know everything, when I walk into the room, then no one can think that I'm, no one can think that I don't know what I'm doing, but 
the further you get into your career, you realize like, oh God, I can't, I can't lead with my ego. I have to lead with like intention of what we want to accomplish as a team. And it is, I mean, I think whether you go through that evolution via entrepreneurship or through, you know, working for different companies and moving up kind of that corporate ladder, it's funny to me how many people don't have that realization and don't work on that part because I think it makes the difference between people who are really able to go further and faster with their team. Mm -hmm. Um, but you have to like, let go of the ego of you being the smartest person in the room, because that's like, it's a lot, you can derive a lot of pleasure from being told that you're so smart, but like, do you want pleasure or do you want success? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And can you you bring in, yeah. (laughs) Right. Um, I want it all. (laughs) I want it all. Um, so we're talking about, um, putting together teams. And one of the reasons that we invited you here is because you are so often in the thick of this whole creative process from ideation to bringing these things to life. And your team has brought some really recognizable, big award-winning things to life. I want to know as someone who works in the corporate side of stuff versus the startup side where Kelsey and I reside, like, like how long does that take? What is that process like? Like there's so much bureaucracy that to me, when major corporations are in alignment, they bring something really special to life. I am like blown away. Cause I'm like, I know how that bureaucracy works. It's not easy. There's a lot of opinions and there's a lot of things that are going on and you've led teams through that on some pretty huge projects. Like, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. I think you really need two things, right? You need, um, and I think it, to me, I always default to the people in the situation, right? So some folks will default to the systems that are in place that enabled something. Some people will maybe think first of the business objectives that all kind of fell into place that allowed for something to happen. But my mind always goes to the people who make this stuff happen, which sounds cheesy, but that's that's what I think the secret sauce is to when you see something really big that you know took a Herculean effort and probably had to get over tons of roadblocks for you to even see it, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think you need leaders who not only have conviction and clarity of thought around why they want to do something, but you need leaders who are passionate in helping communicate and convey the objectives of what they're doing to all the people who could potentially poke holes in it, shut it down. And they also need to have a sense of openness that allows them to see when the holes that are being poked should be poked, right? And how you can use that to make what you're doing even better, right? So you do Mm -hmm. kind of going back to the idea of ego, you need someone who is not defensive, but can be receptive to all the ways that they're inevitably going to be challenged when they want to do something that's bold. Um, And then kind of on the flip side, you need a group of people who are able to help make that happen through every different aspect of how it comes to life. And you need those people to generally all believe in the objective and the mission of what you're trying to do. Um, So there needs to be a little bit of, it's interesting, there needs to be a little bit of unity of thought, not in a group think kind of way, but in a way where we can all agree what needs to get done here. And that doing that is the right thing to do. I think so much discord and so much um, trouble happens internally when you're trying to make something if people ultimately whether you know it or not can't really agree on you know what they're trying to do or why they're trying to do it so Mm -hmm. you need passionate leaders who are willing to help overcome barriers and bring the right people into the conversation um and who are willing to adapt and be nimble along the way but you also need this whole group of people who are coming at that same goal from their own expertise, from their own perspective, 
And they all need to believe that it's the right thing to do too. To me, not having that can kind of be like the silent death of something, you know, Yeah. Um, yeah. where you kind of find yourself in a situation of like, why did this go off the rails? Like, why aren't we able to move the ball forward on this? And often it's not because there's, you know, a legitimate issue that's staring you in the face that you can see on paper. Often it's because of discord within the own, within your own team, you know, mm, you might not even be aware of because people are fundamentally on a different page about what should be done and why. Yeah. Are there any projects you can talk about over the last couple of years that stand out in your mind as like moments that you felt like, oh my God, this all really clicked. Like we all absolutely pulled together on this. And the outcome has been like, so fulfilling, so rewarding. I'm going to have to think about it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me pop you another, another fun, uh, low key question. You've been doing a lot of speech writing lately. Mm -hmm. You also are a huge fan of prestige television. If you could write a speech for a character or an actor who would you want to write it for oh oh my gosh that is both the most exciting question i've (laughs) entertained in days and an impossible (laughs) question to answer can we can we drill down a little bit what's the genre you can give me any anyone and that'll help me choose dramedy oh okay okay Hmm. I mean, I was going to go, I was going to go Brian Cox just because I missed him so much on the last half of the last season, but I think that I could probably come up with a better answer if I thought about it a little bit more. He'd be great though. Anyone with an accent, it's got to be fun, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I love this. I feel like you would write a great speech for Brian Cox and he would just read it once through and then like let it rip and do it in one take. Yeah. It'd be perfect. He could read it on like his iPhone, you know, like people do with wedding speeches now. Oh my God. Oh, did you win? That's a no for me. That's a no for me. I don't really know what to do about that. I just put it in a little notebook, print it out, hold a cute little notebook, open it in front of you with the pages right yes, that was one of our first friend outings too when we got the notebook for your yes. guests sign in at your wedding yeah Rachel uh Rachel you came into my life uh just as the first round of printed wedding invitations were going out and we had a couple people RSVP no and then I was like do you want to come to my wedding in another country and you're like I actually have plans that weekend in New York and I was like just fly from New York just like leave from New York and you're like how about this I'll take you shopping for your guest book instead and I was like okay (laughs) I really thought about it um I would have loved it I still haven't gotten to Iceland so maybe for like Jasper's fifth we all take a trip there (gasps) I'm sorry I love that kid but I think we should do uh, a girl's (laughs) ring road trip in the summertime during the solstice for sure. Oh, yes. Yeah. Take me yeah. back to, I, I, I love bringing up the blue lagoon and being like, listen, as someone who doesn't always love touristy attractions. And I love how people are like, Oh, that's the most touristy thing you can do. I'm like, if this is touristy, sign me up. Yeah. Put a little bracelet on me. Let me swim around, get my wine and my silicone face mask. But we have learned the lessons ladies. Have Oof. we not? We do not, do not dunk the your water. hair. We do not do dunk, not her dunk her hair. your hair. Your Our hair was strong for a while. Oh my god! Oh my god! I was like, I think so it had blonde. salt crystals coming off of it. <laughs> yes, I was <laughs> like, like I was like, what happened? And I remember like running around Reykjavik trying to find a salon that had. We walked in and we were like, we put our hair under the water at the Blue Lagoon. And I remember the woman. She looks at me. She goes, "Your colorist is going to be so mad at you." And I was just like, "I'm getting married in two days." And they're like, "Here you go." take this conditioner, take this clarifying shampoo. And I remember we like passed it around from like hotel room to hotel room of like, let's try and resuscitate. I'll never forget the texture after. Oh, it, it was, was rough. 
Oh really my gosh, rough. not the thing you want 48 hours before your no, wedding. No, we're in a salt pool drinking and we're swimming underwater. We Silica. were assholes. We were pretending Silica to be like breaching the, whales. We were in there for two tip. hours. <laughs> we just dehydrated the shit out of ourselves, drank. <laughs> then we were like, oh. straight from the plane. Oh Is there the any kind of stuff that you get the little packet that goes into the pocket of clothes sometimes when you buy it? That's I think so. Stuff. I yeah. think so. Yeah. No, yeah. but it was like, you know, it was just like in a bowl and they like give you these little cups and you like put it on your face. It's great. Yeah. It was bold. Oh, um, Rachel, this has been so great. Thank you for sharing your insights with us, your thoughts. It's really special to get to talk to someone about what drives them. And um, I don't know, we're just, I feel like we're really lucky to, to get to see a little bit of a peek into that process that has like, honestly touches a lot of people's lives in ways that they don't understand or know. Um, and I know your team's really lucky to have you as a leader. Oh, thanks, gals. Yeah. yeah, I love doing that invisible work. Yeah, it's great. You're a brilliant editor. I feel like you're you're a, you're a sculptor. I forget who it was that said like, sculpting is mostly the art of taking everything away that's not the sculpture, you know? And I think that that's, sounds like the approach that you take for your work too. Yeah, love to find Good the analogy. noise and get rid of it. I Good love analogy. it. Well, Thank you all for joining us for this most recent episode of No Surprises. You can find us at nosurprises.com and listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. We will be back with more fun episodes uh, in the, the coming weeks. Is it nosurprises.com? Do we own no surprises podcast.com? Oh, got it. No Boy. And you can also at, find it on YouTube. We get the website and YouTube. <laughs> Anywhere where you get your potty goodness. Nope. Mm-mm, don't like that. That's not nope. going to work. And it's staying in. <laughs> I don't know if that'll get edited out, but that's not, I'm not going to say that again. <laughs> okay.